Hello and good day, good day, uh, evening, everyone, and welcome to our IVF webinar. Once again, we are right here with Dr. Daniel Baudry. He was with us this week before uh, with uh, a different topic tonight. He is back to present uh, ovarian stimulation topic, and of course, he will discuss it uh, during his presentation. So welcome back, Dr. Baudry. I hope you had a nice day and are ready to uh, give us some more details on ovarian stimulation. Uh, your presentation, as always, um, has lots and lots of details, useful ones. So how are you feeling tonight? I'm very good, thanks. Uh, looking forward to, to start uh, this interesting topic. Definitely. Again, this is a, another interesting topic you have mentioned before you were talking about double stimulation. Uh, but tonight I know that you will uh, talk about some other aspects uh, of uh, stimulation. So this is definitely, again, another interesting topic for all the patients. So uh, thanks so much for joining us tonight. And as always, remember that you will have a chance to ask your questions. So uh, you can learn a bit more uh, from the presentation. But I guess Q&A session is always your favorite part because that way you can simply ask anything that's on your mind that you might need uh, help with. Uh, and of course, Dr. Baji will uh, definitely help you out. Um, if you haven't been able to join us on Tuesday, then let me just mention that uh, Dr. Daniel Baudry, he is the gynecologist with lots and lots of experience in IVF field. And he is uh, working as a gynecologist at IVF Spain in Alicante. And this is uh, his, I think, fourth uh, webinar so far. So we are always pleased that you are joining us here over and over again. And now I think it's time to start with our topic tonight, OK? Thank you. Excellent. Let's go ahead then. So thank you, Caroline, for the kind introduction. Mm -hmm. uh, dear participants, it's a real pleasure to be invited by uh, my IVF answers again uh, to hold this uh, webinar on the topic of ovarian stimulation drugs and, and protocols. Although uh, this topic uh, could be considered as common uh, knowledge for those who work uh, in the field, but um, I hope that with this uh, slightly didactic uh, presentation, uh, I will be able to help uh, those patients who are uh, just uh, starting their uh, fertility treatment journey to uh, gain a, a better understanding on the wide uh, variety of drugs uh, that are used and uh, the protocols that could be uh, tailored for their uh, particular need. So mm, before starting, uh, a quick uh, self-introduction. I was trained in assisted reproduction in France and Spain and obtained a PhD and MSc from the universities of Barcelona and, and Leeds. I um, had a quite international working uh, experience uh, so far, uh, having worked in uh, renowned uh, fertility clinics uh, around the world. Uh, um, for example, the Eugene Clinic in Barcelona, Cato Ladies Clinic in Tokyo, and also the London Women's Clinic in the UK. Uh, I'm interested in research, and uh, my uh, clinical, uh, clinical and also research topics include uh, egg donation, uh, innovative uh, stimulation protocols, including uh, mild ovarian stimulation and natural cycle IVF. And also, uh, I'm interested in optimizing the embryo transfer procedure and in uh, 3D ultrasound uh, too. So let's start uh, the presentation. First, I would uh, like just to quickly give you um, like a physiological uh, background of uh, the hormonal regulation of the menstrual uh, cycle. On the left, uh, you could see um, the <clears throat> part of, of the system. So this is uh, just uh, briefly uh, explaining uh, the hypothalamus, which secretes the so-called GnRH uh, hormone. This uh, stimulates the gonadotropins that, that are secreted from the anterior pituitary, the FSH and LH hormone. These are the hormones that uh, stimulate uh, the follicles uh, within the ovaries. And uh, the ovaries, in turn, uh, 
the follicles produce the estrogens and later the progesterone that also have a feedback effect uh, on the stimulating uh, hormones. On the right side, uh, you could see the, the hormonal changes and the follicular growth uh, during a normal uh, menstrual cycle. One could see that uh, there's a, an increase uh, in the mm, FSH level during the early uh, follicular phase, which uh, uh, produces the selection of a dominant uh, follicle. Later in mid-cycle, there's a LH surge, which uh, produces the oocyte maturation and the ovulation. Let's go further. How uh, it is relevant to the concept of ovarian stimulation? If you look on the left, uh, there's um, the process of the um, follicular uh, follicular genesis, the follicular uh, development, which is a quite long process, more than 120 days. There's the first uh, part, uh, which is uh, independent of the gonadotropins. So the gonadotropins are these hormones which are uh, secreted uh, by the uh, pituitary, the FSH and LH. There's a second phase uh, from the moment when the follicles are already larger, uh, so-called small antral follicles that could be also seen on the ultrasound scan as uh, follicles of two to nine millimeters. This stage is when the follicles become uh, sensitive to these two hormones and uh, these hormones are also used during the ovarian stimulation. And, um, under the effect of these hormones, a, a small follicle could grow to a mature size of uh, up to two uh, centimeters. On the right, uh, you can see uh, on this uh, panel uh, the concept of, of basically of ovarian stimulation. So the concept of the FSH threshold and the window period. So during a natural cycle on the first picture, uh, this FSH only increases uh, slightly above the threshold during a relatively limited period. So this allows the selection of one single dominant follicle. In the middle picture, you could see what happens during conventional high dose of ovarian stimulation because more uh, FSH uh, activity hormone is injected with uh, ovarian stimulation during a longer uh, window period. So this allows the selection of most of the available uh, tiny follicles and several eggs mature and several eggs could be re uh, retrieved from a successful stimulation. Whereas on the third picture, you could see the concept of mild ovarian stimulation when uh, the dose is much smaller and uh, this allows only of the selection of a uh, few follicles and less eggs, which could be uh, less burdensome uh, for the patient. So uh, let's start uh, uh, basically with the medication part. There are two parts of this uh, presentation. You could see that if we uh, try to classify the, the drugs that are used for the stimulation, we could, uh, we have three large groups. The oral agents or the medications that could be administered orally in, in tablet form. Uh, another large group is the gonadotropins. These uh, um, hormones uh, that uh, stimulate the growth of the follicles. These are the FSH hormone, the LH hormone, or even the HCG, the pregnancy hormone could be used uh, during the stimulation. And the third group is uh, the GnRH analogs. So, uh, those hormones that are similar to GnRH and uh, are very helpful as uh, adjuvant uh, uh, drugs uh, during the ovarian stimulations. And these are uh, the drugs that uh, are used to prevent the, the ovulation of the growing follicles. So let's start with the uh, first group, the uh, tablets. So these are uh, oral uh, agents. Basically, there are two main drugs. Uh, clomiphene uh, citrate, which is uh, a selective uh, estrogen receptor modulator or has anti-estrogen uh, effects. So this drug does not uh, stimulate directly the, the ovaries. It causes uh, mm. an increase in the body's own FSH from the hypophysis 
50 to 60 percent, a slight uh, increase. So this is the effect that uh, can safely uh, stimulate uh, the ovaries. This is the drug which has been used for the most time, over 50 years, and it has a very good safety profile, meaning that it is well tolerated, although sometimes there are some side effects, but mainly it could be used for the treatment of ovulation induction in patients who do not ovulate regularly, and usually the result is a ovulation of um, one follicle. There's another drug, the letrozole, the brand name is Fumara, a so-called aromatase inhibitor, which also um, acts through uh, an indirect uh, way to increase the FSH uh, production from the hypothesis. So this drug uh, nowadays is replacing the clomid because um, it uh, has very uh, like uh, positive effects. It does not have uh, some of the negative effects of the clomid, and it is also very safe. Usually, both drugs are uh, used uh, during the first um, at the beginning of the menstrual cycles uh, during uh, five days. Let's continue with uh, the other large uh, group of medication. These are injectable drugs, uh, protein hormones. Uh, the FSH, the LH, uh, and the HCG uh, that are used uh, during ovarian stimulation. Uh, you could see that uh, some of them are, have only FSH activity, some of them only LH activity, some of the preparations, but there's also a mixture of FSH and LH activity, which is very useful. And there's also the pregnancy hormone, the HCG. The origin of these drugs uh, could be either urinary, or recombinant. So we have uh, all these different drugs uh, with their brand names. So let's uh, look at them in, in detail. Uh, first, uh, I should um, explain you a little bit uh, the history of these uh, gonadotropins. So actually, they are, are, have been discovered almost uh, 100 uh, years ago in the 1920s. So uh, identified. Uh, and later uh, in the in 1950, uh, uh, HMG, or uh, one type of hormone, uh, was uh, extracted from the urine of perimenopausal, uh, postmenopausal uh, women. So uh, this drug uh, was, use, was used uh, successfully in uh, obtaining a pregnancy in ovulation induction in 1962. So this was uh, still before the IVF era. And uh, as a um, Everybody well knows in 1978, the first IVF pregnancy was produced, but this was still produced in an unstimulated natural cycle. But from uh, shortly afterwards, from 1981, uh, the stimulation protocols were established with the use of uh, HMG and HCG uh, preparations, and the success rate of IVF uh, has increased uh, considerably. Another main uh, milestone was uh, the appearance of recombinant uh, hormones uh, uh, that were um, authorized in 1995 uh, in, the, in Europe. And since we have seen that there are new preparations like recombinant LH, recombinant HCG, uh, the long-acting FSH, and the biosimilars uh, too. So let's look at uh, these uh, hormone uh, groups uh, in detail. So first, uh, I would like to um, introduce the um, urinary uh, gonadotropins, which could be either FSH only uh, activity or a mixture of FSH and LH. So um, these are uh, hormones, uh, as mentioned, that uh, uh, always contains the FSH hormone that stimulates uh, the ovaries. But uh, the HMG, which is uh, the uh, sort of hormone that is extracted from the urine of menopausal women, has also FSH and LH activity, which is useful for the uh, obtention of, of uh, good quality uh, follicles. Uh, because of the origin of, of this uh, urinary hormone, of course, there's issues with uh, limited uh, supply. And uh, another uh, issue that um, these hormones need to be purified and the process is quite uh, complicated, although it has improved uh, during the years. And nowadays, uh, 
so-called HP or highly purified uh, preparations are, are used. The advantage of these preparations is that these could be administered uh, subcutaneously uh, and not only uh, on a, with uh, intramuscular injection. Um, but there's an issue of batch-to-batch uh, -batch, uh, variability or variable uh, bioactivity because of the uh, simply the urinary uh, origin and the uh, production uh, process of these hormones. Some common uh, brand names are Menopure, Menogon, Meriofert, or Fostipure. So uh, these uh, urinary hormones are mostly uh, getting uh, replaced or more and more by their recombinant uh, versions. So these uh, recombinant versions have appeared uh, later, uh, in the late uh, 90s. Uh, these are um, either uh, FSH-only activity, most of them, alpha-folytropin, beta-folytropin, delta-folytropin, and uh, more recently, corifolytropin, or also there could be a mixture of uh, FSH and LH activity, which is the recombinant uh, pergovaris. So let's uh, see then what are the main features of these recombinant hormones. So because they are produced with a completely different recombinant uh, technology, it allows a much larger uh, scale uh, production. This was developed for the first hormone in 1988. But you can see that actually the authorization of these uh, first two products, Gonalef and Puregon, it happened uh, years later in 1995 and 1996. So it's quite a, a complicated process. The main advantage of these hormones is that uh, they are uh, very uh, pure uh, hormones. Uh, the activity could be precisely measured. Uh, actually, in uh, they're filled by mass, which means that it is known exactly what is the amount of the drugs uh, uh, present in, in, in one uh, uh, vial or, or a cartridge. Therefore, the ovarian response is also more uh, consistent and there's less uh, cycle uh, cancellation that could occur. They could be administered, of course, uh, subcutaneously because it's a very pure uh, preparation, either with a syringe, but uh, most uh, recently with uh, or, or most often with, with the so-called pen devices that you can see for uh, Gonalef and, and Puregon. These are very convenient devices and the advantage that it's easy to use. And for example, the dosages uh, could be, um, could be um, tailored and monitored uh, very precisely with very small uh, increments. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, storage and shelf life, maybe it's uh, important to, to notice that once uh, the patient starts to use uh, these uh, injections, they have to be used within one month. So uh, uh, they could be stored um, at room temperature, but uh, um, they cannot be used for, for uh, several uh, stimulation cycles. The ma main brand names, uh, brand names originally Gonalev, Puragon, and more recently Ovalib and Benfola are so-called biosimilar, biosimilar hormones that uh, has to have the same uh, activity as Gonalev, uh, but um, are produced by a different uh, manufacturer. So, Another type of the recombinant hormone, uh, which has appeared more recently in 2010, is Alonva, which is a so-called long-acting uh, recombinant FSH analog, uh, corifolytropin alpha. So this hormone was engineered in a way uh, to have a much longer activity. And the idea was to uh, replace the daily injections. Yes, all of these hormones need to be administered daily because their half-life is quite small. But in this case, for, uh, for this hormone, uh, one injection is valid for, for seven days. So one injection replaces seven uh, daily injections. Still, um, because um, ovarian stimulation usually lasts more than uh, seven days, it can last... Uh, uh, 9, 10, 11, 13 days, depending on the patient. So in most cases, two-thirds of the cases, some additional injections are necessary, but only for a, for a few days. It is administered uh, similarly as other recombinant gonadotropins with a, a subcutaneous uh, way, with a pre-filled uh, syringe uh, that has two different doses, depending on the weight of the patient. Another newer gonadotropin, uh, the most recent one, uh, authorized in 
2016 is the Racovel for the tropin delta, which uh, has a structurally different uh, uh, from from the previous ones. Uh, it is also dosed by mass, not international units, but rather uh, micrograms. It has a very uh, positive risk-benefit balance, meaning that uh, based on a large study, uh, the manufacturers developed a dosing algorithm. So it is uh, possible to determine the necessary dose to the patient based on her weight and the AMH level, so based on the ovarian reserve uh, marker. And the, and the aim is to uh, avoid uh, uh, ovarian hyperstimulation uh, syndrome or low response, uh, uh, producing like a, a number of eggs, which is uh, in the normal uh, range. It is administered with a, with a pen device and the brand name is Recoval. So uh, let's talk about uh, other, uh, another type of uh, gonadotropins, the HCG hormone. So this hormone um, is mainly used to uh, at the end of the stimulation, when the follicle uh, size is uh, ready, to induce the so-called uh, oocyte maturation, because this hormone has a very strong LH activity. It also has a prolonged half-life. Uh, this hormone is, is present in the organism uh, up to seven to eight days. So this hormone only could be introduced, uh, used to those patients who uh, don't have a, a risk of uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Those patients will produce a normal amount or maybe a low amount of eggs. In terms of the form uh, this uh, or the origin, this could be also urinary origin extracted from uh, the urine of uh, not menopausal but pregnant women or uh, a recombinant form uh, which is used uh, more recently. Uh, depending whether it's urinary or recombinant, uh, administration is either intramuscular or uh, subcutaneous with a pen device. So the brand names, you could see them. Um, most often we use uh, Ovitrel or Ovidrel, which is the recombinant form and could be uh, administered with a pen device very conveniently. And finally, let's talk about a third uh, group of uh, drugs, the so-called GnRH analogues. There are two types of them, the GnRH agonist and the GnRH antagonist. We will see the, the differences. So the GnRH agonists are uh, basically uh, similar to the hormone uh, GnRH. On this uh, scheme uh, to the left, you could see that the GnRH hormone, uh, which is secreted by the hypothalamus just above the hypothesis, uh, part of the central nervous system uh, stimulates the receptor, its receptor, and this uh, uh, liberates the FSH and LH hormone from the hypothesis, uh, which uh, in turn uh, later will uh, stimulate uh, the growth of the ovarian follicles. If we use uh, this uh, so called GnRH analogues, so like a similar uh, type of modified hormones uh, that has been uh, have been produced uh, artificially, then uh, these hormones, uh, the idea of using in these hormones is to block uh, this uh, receptor, meaning that uh, causing a sort of um, uh, pituitary down regulation, meaning uh, that uh, with this we could avoid uh, premature ovulation, uh, which could uh, happen during ovarian stimulation and could ruin the results uh, of an ovarian stimulation. So we have two types of uh, GnRH analogues. The agonists uh, have uh, a very uh, strong affinity to this uh, receptor, and they act uh, initially through a so-called flare-up effect. So they have, a, at the beginning, a, a stimulatory effect, but later uh, the downregulation uh, sets in, which is prolonged and uh, could be used during the whole time of the uh, ovarian uh, stimulation. The administration is a subcutaneous injection, either in a daily or a depot form. Uh, and the brand names are Decapeptide, Rupron, uh, Procrine, uh, Suprafect, Zolodex. There's only uh, one uh, type of uh, GnRH agonist, the Cinerel, which could be also administered in a nasal spray, which is, could be convenient for some patients. So 
The, another type of the GnRH analogs are the GnRH antagonists, which are uh, more recently introduced drugs in 2001. And they are very convenient because uh, they have similar effects, but this effect is not long term. So it has an immediate, but only uh, like a reversible uh, down regulation effect for 24 hours. So these drugs are also used during the IVF uh, cycle to avoid uh, the premature ovulation. These are administered uh, with, uh, in the form of subcutaneous uh, injections. Uh, you have two preparations, uh, cetratide and orgalutran, that are uh, quite similar. And they are very useful uh, for the protocol that we call the, the GnRH antagonist protocol. And we will see uh, how it looks uh, later. So basically, we have covered uh, the main type of the medications. Now we could uh, talk a little bit about uh, the protocols that could be um, tailored uh, using them. So there are two types of uh, treatments. One is the ovulation induction um, or uh, with uh, or without uh, intrauterine insemination. So here uh, the aim is to uh, slightly stimulate the ovaries, uh, maybe to have one or two, not more than, than three follicles, and then either have a timed intercourse or maybe to do uh, intrauterine insemination, meaning introducing the prepared sperm inside the womb. But the aim is, uh, so that the fertilization happens naturally, the aim is to obtain a, a singleton pregnancy. There's no egg retrieval here. You could see that the protocols could be uh, either a uh, on the unstimulated natural cycle or a modified natural cycle, or some tablets could be used or a more stronger uh, stimulation with the gonadotropin injections. The other treatment, which uh, of course also very important is uh, in vitro fertilization, where ovarian stimulation is necessary to stimulate several follicles and obtain many eggs and then extract these eggs and submit them to fertilization with a conventional IVF or the ICSI procedure. Again, also with these protocols, one could uh, use a natural cycle IVF or minimal stimulation, or one can use the agonist or uh, antagonist protocols. So let's see them in detail. Before, of course, uh, choosing the right protocol, it's very important to evaluate the ovarian reserve of the patient, to see uh, how many follicles uh, she has, and to predict uh, the possible ovarian response, whether it would be a low response, a normal response, or a high response. This could be done with a 2D or 3D scan. These tiny follicles uh, could be seen, uh, those that I've mentioned at the beginning of the, of the presentation, the so-called small uh, antral follicles. And we could also evaluate the level of the AMH hormone, which also correlates very well with the expected ovarian response. So let's see uh, just briefly the protocols that are used for ovulation induction or intrauterine insemination. One is the natural cycle where uh, no stimulation is used, or sometimes we could uh, mm -hmm. give um, uh, just a, a so-called triggering agent, uh, HCG usually, uh, to um, time uh, the, the to time the intercourse or the intrauterine insemination. Basically, to once we have a follicle to um, give this injection, and this will uh, cause the ovulation uh, approximately 36 hours uh, later. Uh, another protocol uh, is uh, to stimulate with uh, these clomiphene tablets, which is uh, often used in uh, polycystic ovary patients or those patients who don't have uh, ovulation. It's a um, uh, quite... Um, efficient uh, method to, to produce uh, an ovulation. Unfortunately, because of the effect of the, of the clomiphene and the estrogenic effect, effect on the lining, uh, this, this uh, pregnancy rates could be, could be relatively lower. And the, the most efficient way of doing uh, ovarian stimulation, but also one that uh, uh, has uh, some risk of uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, or multiple pregnancies is to stimulate directly from the beginning of a cycle with a, a relatively low dose, uh, depending on, on patient characteristics of uh, daily uh, FSH uh, or HMG 
uh, injections. Also, uh, monitoring is needed, and uh, if the number of follicles uh, is not higher than, than three, then uh, the patient could go forward with the triggering agent and uh, timed intercourse or intrauterine insemination. Now let's uh, take a look at the IVF protocols. So again, uh, IVF protocols uh, also have uh, the so-called uh, natural cycle version uh, and the mildly stimulated version, but these are uh, used not so often in, uh, in everyday practice. If we think about uh, ovarian stimulation, where the aim is to obtain uh, as much eggs as possible, then the historical protocol, which was used uh, since uh, 1981, was the long uh, generage uh, agonist uh, protocol. In this treatment, which is called long because it could last uh, three to four weeks or more sometimes, there's a first phase, uh, which starts uh, usually uh, around the day 21 uh, of the menstrual cycle, so like one week before uh, the onset of a menstrual period, when daily injections of this generage antagonists are given uh, to obtain uh, like a down regulation of the, of the pituitary and, and the ovaries uh, too. After approximately 10 days or 14 days, when it is confirmed that uh, the uh, ovaries are quiet, uh, and the lining is thin, then daily injections of um, FSH uh, containing medications are added to. The dose, of course, is individualized depending on patient characteristics, and then serial ultrasounds are done to monitor the growth of the follicles. When at the end we have the desired size of the several follicles, then uh, HCG uh, of vitrell is given to uh, mature these follicles and egg collection is done uh, 36 uh, hour, uh, hours later. The advantages of this um, protocol is that uh, all the follicles are usually the same size, so there's little follicular asynchrony, so the size is, is usually similar. This advantage is the duration, that's why it's called the long protocol, uh, that uh, quite a lot of medications are needed. And also there's an important risk of this so-called OHS risk because we use this so-called HCG trigger it is a very strong trigger, and in those patients who have a high amount of eggs, they could suffer from uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Another version of this so-called generage agonist protocol, when this uh, first uh, generage analog is used, is a so-called short protocol. It is advantageous for uh, patients uh, who have a low ovarian response or uh, expected low ovarian response, low ovarian reserve markers, or have advanced uh, female age. We have mentioned that uh, at the beginning of, of its administration, this GnRH agonist has this so-called flare-up effect. So it has a stimulatory effect at the beginning, and it is taken advantage of with this protocol. So usually uh, it is uh, started uh, at the beginning of a menstrual cycle, first uh, the administration, daily administration of a GnRH agonist, it is indicated with the number two here. And then immediately, uh, two days later, uh, a stimulation uh, drug, FSH or HMG is also added. And this combined uh, stimulatory effect sometimes is beneficial for low responder patients. Monitoring, ultrasound monitoring, of course, is necessary. And at the end, we have to use uh, this HCG trigger again to schedule the egg collection. So again, with this uh, method, there's a risk of OHSS, and it has been also shown to be less efficient than the long previous long protocol in terms of pregnancy rates. What is the third protocol that is uh, very convenient? As I mentioned, since 2001, we have this gene range antagonist, and this has uh, resulted in a very convenient protocol, the so-called gene range antagonist or short protocol because it lasts approximately less than less than two weeks from the beginning of a menstrual cycle. It is suited to poor responders, normal responders, and high responders. And in most clinics, uh, at least in Europe, uh, this has become the uh, first line uh, protocol for ovarian stimulation for IVF. The advantage is that the risk of OHSS is reduced because this antagonist has also uh, a sort of uh, uh, moderating uh, uh, 
effect on the ovarian stimulation, but mostly because uh, this protocol, uh, with this protocol, we could use for this final uh, ovarian maturation, not only the HCG, but uh, another sort of tr trigger, a short acting trigger, which is called the generation agonist trigger. So this uh, helps us uh, to uh, mitigate any risk of uh, ovarian hyperstimulation in those patients who are high responders. One disadvantage might be uh, this uh, so-called follicular asynchrony, that uh, the size of the follicles could be uh, unequal and also the quality of eggs that are retrieved uh, with this protocol. Uh, since uh, recently, uh, there have been also a development, uh, thanks to this uh, generate antagonist protocols, also with the so-called non-conventional starter protocols. So all of these uh, stimulation protocols that I've shown uh, usually start at the beginning of a menstrual cycle. But uh, with this protocol, um, it is also possible to do uh, a different start, for example, in the second half of the menstrual cycle or independently uh, from the stage of the menstrual cycle, or the so-called double ovarian stimulation protocol, uh, which is shown here. So basically, we would have a first antagonist stimulation protocol starting at the beginning of a menstrual cycle. And after the egg collection, two, three days late, later, immediately another stimulation is done. This is uh, have been shown uh, to be feasible. And uh, the advantage that in this case, from one uh, uh, menstrual cycle during a one month period, uh, two back-to-back -back, uh, stimulations can be done and more eggs are retrieved for mainly for lower responder uh, patients. So basically, this is the um, outline of, the, of, the, of my talk. Uh, I mean, I've shown you the medications and the stimulation drugs. Uh, a few quick words about our clinic in Alicante, where I'm uh, currently working. So this is a, a state-of-art uh, facilities, uh, equipped with state-of-art facilities, uh, an excellent embryology lab, and our own genetic uh, department too, where we can do pre-implantation genetic testing, endometrial testing, uh, immune system testing too, and we don't have to send away any sample. So all the tests have to, could be done uh, in-house. Our uh, medical team is uh, quite multilingual because uh, we have mostly uh, uh, cross-border reproductive care uh, patients from all over Europe. You can see the, the team uh, who's uh, uh, more than uh, multilingual. And uh, our group also has uh, other clinics. The headquarters in Spain are in Alicante, but there's also another clinic in Madrid and in the north of the country. And we have two branches uh, in abroad, uh, one in uh, Baden-Baden, in Germany, and another one in Manchester uh, in the UK. So uh, thank you very much for your patience. It was a little bit uh, long, uh, didactic uh, presentation. Now I would like to hand back to... Uh, Caroline, and uh, we could uh, discuss all the questions that you, you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much indeed. As always, you've been very thorough with explaining every single medication. And actually, uh, there is one question you already also mentioned uh, this, but I guess we can still have a look at that, okay? Maybe there's something else you can add uh, because patients, uh, was thought that of course you will. Uh, it hasn't been mentioned. I'm talking about a non va medication. Yes. It wasn't missing, as you know. We you have discussed this. Uh, what do you think about application of the lonva and for which patient group would it work best? Yeah, um, um, Alonva, of course, is, is very interesting. So the the main objective was, of course, to to um, to. Um, like reduce the treatment burden because uh, seven injections are, are definitely a, a good idea to I mean to substitute it with with one uh, injection. So um, of course uh, I mean maybe there might be a disadvantage that uh, it is a little bit difficult to to uh, I mean there's only two dosages uh, like um, available depending on the on the patient's uh, weight. So higher weight patients would, would receive the, the, the higher dose injection. But um, because the first seven days um, cannot be, cannot be um, I mean, unless somebody wants to add uh, the extra injections earlier, but um, cannot be like uh, tailored. So uh, those uh, 
physicians who like to, to, to control like the stimulations uh, very closely might be a little bit uh, reluctant to, to use ELOMVA. But nonetheless, all the studies that have been published so far uh, have shown that uh, ELOMVA uh, has the same uh, efficiency as, as other uh, recombinant dogs. So there's no point of, of uh, not using it. Um, um, as to which group patients group would it work the best? Uh, I mean, um, probably uh, normal responders uh, would be okay, and uh, I mean even well high responders uh, in case if, if the possibility of the, if it's done with a generate uh, antagonist protocol and then the possibility of 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 um, of um, agonist trigger is, is available. Understood. Thank you so much for, again, uh, mentioning this. And of course, uh, for your answer, your question, and let's get going. There are more questions, more detailed ones coming up as well. Uh, let's have a look at this one. So I'm 42, AMA 0.2, estradiol 50. I had a stillbirth last year. I have had two fate IVF cycle using Gonalef 150, Monopore 300 due to poor response. I'm wondering, does Prag Broad use the same medication to stimulate the ovaries? Do you think I could have a chance doing IVF abroad before going for donor? Uh, yes. So, well, uh, so it's, yeah, very, uh, I mean, um, complicated, uh, like, uh, previous history, obviously. So, um, I mean, if you look at the stimulation part, so 450 units, uh, like a combination of Menopur and Gonalef was used, which is, um, I mean, the maximum dose uh, that could be used. So, uh, like in uh, nowadays, there's a trend maybe not to go uh, so high with stimulation. So probably maybe in our clinic, we we rarely use more than 300 uh, units or maybe 350 units uh, uh, at a time. It has been shown that. Uh, Increasing to up to 450 usually does not uh, improve the, the response. Sometimes for poor responders, even a, even a lower uh, dose uh, could be um, considered. So um, uh, after two failed IVF cycles, of course, it depends like uh, whether uh, embryos were uh, created or or not. Uh, our approach, at least in, in Alicante, is. Uh, to do embryo banking. Uh, so, I mean, for patients who have low AMH, uh, recently we have also uh, tried to use uh, like ovarian rejuvenation uh, techniques uh, using uh, uh, injections of PRP or platelet-rich uh, plasma, which could be also done um, at the first uh, egg collection. So meaning that uh, we could do it uh, Take advantage of the egg collection. It's it's done under conscious sedation, and then uh, if there's any positive effect, then take advantage of it for the successive uh, cycle. So probably we would use uh, yeah, cancel the cycle was unfortunately canceled. Yeah, so probably we would use a, a lower dose uh, and uh, and see uh, if if any sort of response uh, could be obtained, but. Uh, if uh, there's no eggs uh, whatsoever that are obtained, then, then obviously it's a, it's a problem and maybe uh, egg donation would be the only, only option. Thank you. And well, let me go to, uh, there are some additional information from the very same patient. So let me get to this straight away, okay? So uh, last week I had a fade, second fade IVF cycle due to poor response and I had back-to-back -back cycles as ovaries quiet, were quiet and lining thin. Today my FSH is 1.3.6, sorry. What impact would the gonalef 150 have on my FSH blood result? My FSH was 91.5 in December uh, 2020. Yes, yes, yes. So... Um... I mean, uh, we don't, if, I mean, if the FSH is level uh, so high, then, then obviously, uh, I mean, it should be interesting to know how high was it uh, before ovarian stimulation, but, but uh, probably it, it simply shows like a, a state of, uh, of uh, like premature ovarian uh, insufficiency. 
So usually with uh, such high levels, if, if these uh, like are before the stimulation or, 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 or uh, the, the possibilities of obtaining any kind of ovarian response are, are, are very slim. We don't do any kind of FSH dosing during the, the, the stimulation itself to, to, to check, for example, what, what is the what is the effect of of the, of the drugs uh, that are administered but probably these these levels are are too high so it's not uh, related to the to the to the dose of fsh uh, itself in some patients who do this uh, what i've mentioned the prp and ovarian rejuvenation and it's also published uh, some patients who have even, even this kind of high fsh levels uh, like a couple of months after the intervention, they, their FSH level could uh, could uh, decrease and AMH level could could increase. Thank you so much, of course, for yet another follow up and your help with this. Um, let's have a look. Next question is up. Bit of a longer question again with details. My first stimulation: age thirty one, AMH two point eight, AFC twenty. BMI 19.7 was with 150 gonal F, three follicles, eight M2 eggs, six fertilized. The second protocol, H32, was with 175 gonal F, three follicles, one M2 uh, egg, pro eggs, three protocol, third protocol, H32, doctor has changed to long, 250 pergoveris, 12 follicles, eight M2 eggs, one fertilized, four protocol, short, H33, pergoveris, 300, eight follicles, one M2 egg, uh, zero fertilized, which medication would fit to young patient with poor response to medication as well as affecting positive D? Yes. Positivity, the equality. Yes. So, so obviously, yeah, this is a, a young patient who has a, a quite good uh, ovarian uh, reserve. And um, it seems that, uh, that um, with the, um, at least the, the, the first two protocols that was done with Gonalef, uh, I mean, especially the second one was not very successful. So, uh, but again, uh, there was an issue with the with the fertilization in the, in the third one, no. So uh, although there was uh, more mature eggs with the pergovaris, so um, and again um, only one mature egg uh, and zero fertilized the the, the fourth time. So it is a little bit difficult to 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 see uh, any 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 pattern. So obviously, the idea of the doctor was to 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 use the pergovaris, which has uh, which has, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's not a um, a male factor which which causes the the, the issue uh, of the of the low fertilization rate. So, um, I mean, uh, what hasn't been tried? Uh, yeah, uh, stimulating uh, less uh, with this with this. Uh, like a uh, uh, previous approach would be uh, a little bit difficult, no? Because there was eight eggs uh, once uh, and twice, uh, then one mature egg. So the issue of of, uh, of obtaining a few eggs uh, would be uh, would be a problem. Um, I mean, um, it's. Um, Pergovaris probably is not uh, not uh, not a very bad uh, idea. Maybe uh, the triggering agent could also be uh, changed now because there seemed to be a, a problem with the maturation. So it has to be checked whether it was like HCG or generate agonist or whether it was a dual uh, trigger. So that uh, something that that could be could be tried. I guess all the protocols uh, probably were. Uh, I mean, uh, it could be GNR agent agonist or, or agonist, but uh, yeah, I, I'm not surprised that uh, that, uh, that the clinic does uh, think about some kind of uh, intrinsic uh, um, intrinsic uh, egg quality problem. Maybe what I would it's a little, little bit difficult to to, to analyze uh, like so many data on a webinar. I would. Uh, 
like to encourage you maybe to 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 send us uh, your coordinates and then we can look into the details and maybe to suggest uh, some sort of um, alternative uh, stimulation protocol that would be probably the best that's for sure of course you definitely need more details in order to properly answer and find uh, possible options and um, so of course remember you can get in touch with dr uh, bodry and the team at ivf spain they will be able to help you just in case i will show you this is their email address as you can see right here so if anyone would like to get in touch you can use that of course um okay and let's get going with uh, the another question um I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, there is a thanks, of course, from uh, Anastasia here and also from the previous patient for you for answering. Let's have a look okay. at the next question. Um, this is the next one. What are the success rates for age group of 45? Uh, probably the, um, you're meaning own eggs or donor eggs? If you can yeah. clarify. Yeah, visit Vizone eggs, well, I will answer both of them. So Vizone eggs, of course, uh, the possibilities are are very low. So um, I'm not saying that it's impossible, but uh, probably even in the literature, the oldest patient who, who had a, a successful possibility was uh, like 48-year-old. Um, That's like extreme case report in the literature. In our clinic, probably we had uh, at 46. In any case, uh, we would recommend uh, for those patients who are able to produce uh, embryos to, to perform pre-implantation genetic screening and 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 check uh, to see is there any um, are there any embryos that are genetically normal if if the treatment with own eggs with donor eggs of course it's a different story it's uh, irrespectively of, of recipient age we do treatment uh, up until the age of 50 the, the results are, are are very good so uh, in in the region of of uh, 70 75 percent per, per per embryo transfer Thank you for providing the percentage as well, of course. Um, okay, and let's have a look at this one. Can you provide more information on of administration of Cinerel spray, benefits of it? Uh, well, the obvious benefit is that it's a nasal spray. Um, um, I mean, actually, we don't really have it in, in Spain because in Spain it's not... Uh, in, it's not uh, um, uh, marketed so in german speaking country it is so um, i mean i'm not aware of any like um, additional like uh, particular differences in terms of uh, other uh, types of uh, of uh, uh, gender age agonists which are in, in, in administered uh, administered um, with an injection form uh, maybe the difference, of course, that um, with um, if there's some issues with with uh, with the nasal uh, mucosa, like um, then it could could influence the, the the resorption of of the of the of the drug. So uh, compared to 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 subcutaneous injections, uh, there might be uh, for some patients uh, some issues. But for example, this nasal spray is also used when I worked in Japan at the Kato Ladies Clinic. It was used uh, for uh, for triggering. Uh, it was used um, without any any particular problem. All right. Thank you so much, indeed. Um, let's have a look. More questions are coming up. So can you explain why Progenova is used before stimulation? Is this any good for low AMH? Yeah, so Progenova is um, like an, an estrogen um, tablet. And uh, before stimulation, so basically like uh, two weeks, uh, like in the second half of, of the previous menstrual cycle, it is used to, to achieve this kind of uh, follicular uh, synchrony because uh, giving estrogens could, uh, could help to, to, to synchronize a little bit the cohort, which will be uh, stimulated uh, later. So that's a sort of a, uh, pre-treatment that that could uh, later uh, possibly improve uh, the, the I mean to have like a regular size uh, during the, the the stimulation um, the contraceptive pill maybe could be used for the same purpose but probably Proginova is a little bit uh, not so uh, does not uh, does not uh, 
block so strongly so it could be um, advised for patients who who has low ovarian reserve and and if you don't want to suppress too much uh, her ovarian response uh, later but as with everything i mean uh, this kind of adjuvant treatments uh, there's a uh, um, people who are for people who are well not against but maybe could say that uh, we don't know whether it's uh, it helps or not uh, there's few studies uh, regarding that but that's a definitely a strategy to to improve maybe ovarian response excellent thanks so much marina for your question and your explanation and let's have a look okay next question many thanks for the presentation i will set a consultation i am 45 miscarried twice on in the last two years from natural pregnancy eight weeks would you suggest a donor based on age well the fact that there was uh, two conceptions uh, uh like in the last years is, is sort of a positive uh, sign so i would definitely first evaluate the ovarian reserve with an ultrasound with a image and uh, and if it's good uh, before going on an egg donation of course a stimulation attempt uh, could be done and if embryos are created then uh, i would, would submit them to to pre-implantation genetic testing uh, to see if there's any good quality uh, embryo among them. But of course, at the age of 45, uh, maybe 10 or more uh, blastocysts, day five embryos are needed to, to have like a realistic chance of finding uh, a, a chromosomically normal uh, embryo among them. So only patients maybe with a high ovarian reserve uh, has a, have a chance to obtain so many eggs and so many embryos. All right, again, thank you, Eliana, for sharing and also for your question. And Dr. Badri, as always, for your answer. And there are like two questions left. The next one is a very short one. What is the name of the clinic in Manchester? Yeah, it's, a, it's a, if I know well, it's a RCG uh, clinic. So, but on our website, it could be, it could be found, of course. But uh, we will sure. send you the information, yes. All right. Thank you so much indeed. And let's have a look. That might be our final question. So if you have any, mm -hmm. you know, left, just go ahead, type those in and let's have a look. Okay. Um, so sorry, not this one. I wanted this to prove the, the previous one here. I see you have done lots of research on egg donation. I might have to consider that. I'm wondering why do women donate their eggs in Prague? It doesn't seem like it is for financial gain. Mm -hmm. Well, each country has different uh, legislation, of course. So, um, I mean, in Spain, it is um, quite um, it is something that is quite well established for for practically uh, more than thirty years. Uh, it's well regulated, so um, it's quite easy to to recruit donors uh, in Spain. Uh, Spain itself is a quite uh, altruistic country, so it's not a big deal to, to become a donor. Of course, in, in Spain uh, also, there's a compensation for the for the, all the burden that the donor does, a fixed uh, compensation that the donor receives. So it's a mixture of uh, altruistic and maybe uh, material reasons uh, for, for some donors. But um, basically the main advantage of uh, egg donation in Spain that the clinics have a very good uh, uh, and our clinic too, uh, egg donation programs, uh, a good choice of donors. Of course, it's anonymous uh, egg donation. So it's a clinic who uh, chooses a donors according to the recipient's uh, physical criteria. Thanks again. And of course, as you saw, uh, there was a question if you are able to recommend any clinics in Prague. I'm not aware of the of the, of the infertility scene in, in, the, in the Czech Republic, but I think you recently had a very like a interesting reviews on the legislation, and uh, including yep. also the legislation on egg donation in different countries. So if somebody looks at these webinars attentively, then it's possible to to choose the best country for each uh, patient's uh, needs or, or exactly or so. compare the, the different um, legislations too. Of course. And yes, it's very true. Recently, we have done webinars on different um, IVF laws, so uh, in different countries. So if you go to all my F events, you will be able to find them. And of course, there are some uh, other, we had a webinar in the Czech Republic. So uh, with the Czech Republic, the clinic one, so you can check it out. Okay. 
One, there are two more questions right here. So how often FSA gene mutation happens? Can it be the reason for poor response in your patients? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. I mean, um, in our clinic, we don't uh, we don't analyze uh, this kind of uh, well the mutations, and of course, there are potentially several mutations of them. So it's difficult to see which one uh, is important. So um, I mean, um, it could be an interesting thing to check, but I don't think that it's like a main uh, reason uh, necessarily to for for a low ovarian response. Uh, certainly there are some uh, cases, but uh, I don't think that it's uh, it could explain uh, all cases of, of, of low ovarian response, unfortunately. All right. Thank you so much indeed. Um, and there is another question okay so can i ask i know it's not the talk of the top talk today i am 42 ama 0.2 estradiol 50 can stress have an impact on estradiol level i have high uh, stress levels uh, loss of baby mm -hmm. emotional aspect of hoping to get pregnant again with two fight ivf due to response I think, well, uh, there are some uh, published data that says that, for example, the AMH level, uh, stress uh, stress hormone levels could uh, could have an influence on it. Although, uh, in some cases, at, at 42, uh, we could uh, have uh, this kind of, we see uh, this kind of level too. So it's not uh, completely surprising. Uh, but um, there could be some fluctuation in AMH levels. Maybe one thing to consider is this kind of newer ovarian rejuvenation techniques, although it's quite experimental too. It remains to be seen uh, what is the real impact. Thank you again, of course, for sharing and providing your advice here. And one more for egg donation, would you recommend fresh or frozen eggs for 45 year old publications and also clinical experience shows that there's no uh, big difference in in, in, uh, in outcomes and uh, some publications maybe see like a, a few percent uh, lower success rate with uh, with frozen donor eggs uh, four or five percent less in some depending on the clinic depending on the experience of the clinic but uh, in clinical terms it's not a not a big difference and for example in our clinic at IVF Spain uh, although we do both of them or, or maybe overwhelmingly fresh egg donation uh, the thing that we we prefer because we have like a very well working egg donation program so it's not really uh, we don't really need to, to to use frozen eggs but in our experience when we have compared the results these these were uh, like exactly the, the same so uh, there's no 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 clinically significant difference between the two. And thank you again for that uh, answer. And of course, for your advice, as you can see, uh, there are some comments. We will be finishing for tonight, but everyone, thank you so much for your questions. I do think that it has been useful for you. As always, you never disappoint. You always put uh, very detailed questions, and we are glad that you are here. I'm sure that it's helping in a in a way. So of course, remember as again, this is just like a platform to we want to educate you. But of course, if you definitely want to get uh, some more details, you can get in touch with Dr. Badri and his team at IVF Spain, and they will simply uh, be able to help you a bit even more, right? So um, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Badri is always, always great thank to you. have you. As you can see, many things are right here also for answering the questions, but also for your presentation, as you saw. Um, anything else you would like to add? Well, it was really a very interesting question. So uh, I see that, uh, I saw that there will be not too much questions on, on drugs, but uh, of course, uh, patients are always curious about uh, what could be uh, improved and, and uh, we hope to, to tailor the, the stimulation drugs uh, for the need of each patient. 
Thank you very much. Thank you so much indeed. And remember, it has been recorded, so you will have a chance to watch this webinar tomorrow. It will be available on our site, but also if you want, you can check some previous webinars uh, with Dr. Baudry and, of course, all other ones. There are plenty of them, over 380 webinars so far on our site. And I, saw, I also want to um, invite you, if you are free and are interested, there will be another topic tonight at 8 p.m. UK time. We will talk about IVF um, legislation in Russia. Dr. Diana Obidniak is back with us, so um, if you can join us, I'm sure it's going to be interesting for you as well. Thank you, Dr. Baudry, till our next yeah. event. Uh, we will have shortly a break, summer break, but of course I'm sure we will be back, and no doubt that we will be able to see Dr. Baudry again, so thanks so much. Thank I'm much. already Thank looking you. forward to it. Uh, take care, everyone, and I hope to see you soon right here as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.